Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm not telling a story, I'm talking about a theory. And the theory is that there's a kind of memory in nature that each species of animal or plant has a collective memory. Every individual draws upon it and contributes to it. In its most general form, this theory says that the so-called laws of nature are more like habits. And it has many implications, and one of the most shocking and startling is that our own memories are not stored inside our brains. Our brains are more like uh, television receivers than video recorders. They're, they're, uh, they resonate with things that have happened in the past, but they're not all in there. And we've all been brought up to believe these things. We've been brought up to believe that the laws of nature are eternal, memories are inside our brains, uh, and there's no such thing as collective memories. Well, these are obviously controversial ideas, and the reason I'm putting I think we're going to have to think these kinds of thoughts, whether we like it or not. I like it, some don't. But uh, the reason I, that there is this crisis is because of the change in cosmology. Until the 1960s, most scientists thought the universe was eternal that it was governed by eternal mathematical laws of nature that had always been there. And the universe itself continued forever. It was a kind of eternal machine, slowly running out of steam. Um, but in the 1960s, the Big Bang cosmology took over as the orthodoxy of science. And that tells us the universe began extremely small, less than the size of a head of a pin, and very hot, and it's been growing and expanding ever since. It's an evolutionary cosmology. So if there's an evolutionary cosmology, the universe began about 14 uh, billion years ago, uh, then what about the eternal laws of nature? Uh, could they evolve too? Or were they all there at the moment of the Big Bang, like a kind of cosmic Napoleonic code? Or did they pre-exist in some kind of platonic realm beyond space and time independently of the universe? Now, most scientists are Platonists or Pythagoreans who scratch the surface. And most of them think the laws have always been there. And if they came into being, then they think they all came into being fully formed at the moment of the Big Bang. As my friend Terence McKenna used to say, modern science is based on the principle, give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. And the one free miracle is the appearance of all the matter and energy in the universe and all the laws that govern it from nothing in a single instant. I think instead of this view, um, in an evolutionary universe, it's better to think of the laws of nature as evolving. And in fact, as soon as you start thinking about them, the idea of laws of nature is not a very good uh, metaphor. It's totally anthropocentric. It's based on a metaphor, an analogy with human laws. Human laws do, of course, evolve. Um, and it made sense in the 17th century. God was the cosmic lawgiver and also the cosmic law enforcement agency. Uh, that made sure that everything, everything obeyed the laws. Um, but uh, it's a completely anthropocentric metaphor, and I think a better metaphor is habit. That's not just people that have habits, animals have habits, habits are common throughout all nature. So what I'm suggesting is in an evolutionary universe, the habits of nature evolve. That's the theory in a nutshell. And this makes a lot of scientific predictions. It suggests that everything in nature is habitual. If you crystallize compounds, for example, the crystals that form are based on habits. They crystallize the way they do because the crystals of that kind formed that same way in the past. If you make a completely new chemical, which chemists do all the time, every year, they make thousands of new chemicals. The first time you crystallize something, uh, there won't be a habit for the crystal. It's the first time it's happened in the history of the universe, as far as we know. What I'm suggesting is that the first time it crystallizes, it'll have to wait for a new form to appear. The second time, it'll happen quicker because there'll be an influence from the first ones. The third time, there'll be an influence from the first and the second crystals. There'll be a kind of cumulative memory building up. Um, so it should get easier and easier to crystallize. In fact, it's well known to chemists that new compounds get easier and easier to crystallize all over the world. 
they don't explain it in terms of habits, they explain it in terms of anecdotes. And chemistry, the folklore of chemistry is replete with stories about fragments of crystals being carried around the world from lab to lab on the beards of migrant chemists. And when there haven't been any migrant chemists or any bearded visitors, uh, it's assumed that these fragments of previous crystals wafted around the world as invisible dust particles uh, and settled out in labs, uh, causing the compounds to crystallize more readily. I'm suggesting this will happen even if you exclude migrant chemists and filter dust from the air. And this is a simple area the theory can be tested in. There are other tests with crystals uh, which I discuss uh, in detail uh, in my book, uh, A New Science of Life, which explains this theory and the evidence for it. Obviously, in 15 minutes, I'm not going to be able to give you the evidence you may feel you want, um, uh, because uh, I'm having to race over this very fast. Another area the theory can be tested is in animal behavior. The theory says that if you train rats to learn a new trick in London, then rats all over the world should be able to learn the same trick more quickly, just as the rats have learned it here without any normal means of communication being necessary. Um, now, this may seem outrageous as a prediction, and when I first thought of it, I thought it was outrageous too. Um, then I thought, well, if this has happened, people should have noticed it. And it took me a while to realize that, well, perhaps they have noticed it. Uh, I delved into the voluminous archives of rat psychology and found that um, experiments have already been done that show an effect very, uh, of this kind. In one of the longest series of experiments in rat psychology, rats were trained to escape from water mazes by swimming to the right exit. And it turned out that the rats in successive generations got better and better at doing it. Um, after 20 generations, the rats were doing it 10 times faster than their ancestors. And at first, people thought this was an example of the inheritance of acquired characters, uh, which was another very controversial area of biology. Um, but it was then repeated. The experiments were first done at Harvard, then they were repeated in Edinburgh and in Melbourne. And in Melbourne, Australia, uh, and in Edinburgh, the rats started off more or less where the Harvard rats had left off and continued to improve. In Melbourne, they had a control line of rats. In every generation, they tested rats that hadn't been descended from trained parents. And those got better too. All the rats of that breed were getting better. It's a dramatic, highly significant, well-documented effect. There are many other effects in animal behavior similar to this. And the same should apply to human uh, learning as well. It should be getting easier to learn things that other people have already learned just because they've learned them. It should be getting easier to learn snowboarding, uh, uh, windsurfing, computer programming, playing video games, and so forth. In all these cases, it does seem to be getting easier, but there are many other variables that affect it. And um, this is where you have to look for data where there's standardized data over many years. A perfect case for testing this is intelligence tests, because they haven't changed very much uh, over uh, 70 or 80 years. Um, in IQ tests, I would predict, on the basis of morphic resonance, in fact, I did predict um, that um, the, the memory, uh, the people should be getting better at the tests just because so many people have already done them. Nothing to do with increasing intelligence. Simply, the tests should be getting easier because of a memory effect from people who've done them before. It turns out exactly that effect has been happening all over the world. It's called the Flynn effect after the person who discovered it in the 1980s. And it shows that IQ test scores have gone up on average about 30% all over the world. No other evidence that people are getting smarter, the tests just seem to be getting easier to do. This is happening with lots of exams. Everyone's familiar with the phenomenon of grade inflation, where results in exam standardized exams go up year by year. It usually results in a debate where one lot of people say, oh, the universities and the schools are just dumbing down, and so they can impress the government. And the government then says, no, it just proves how successful our education policies are, and the standards are rising. It may, in fact, be uh, more a matter of, of this memory effect uh, than anything else. This leads to other ideas for testing the theory in the human realm. Many experiments have actually been done in this area that I summarize in my books. But um, uh, my older son thought of one when he was doing GCSEs. Um, 
which I think would be an excellent test, and it illustrates the basic principle. Um, he said to me one day, I and my friends have thought of a, a, a good way of getting extra marks at GCSE without doing extra work. And I said, well, how are you going to do that? He said, bimorphic resonance. That's the name of this memory principle. And I said, well, how, how would that work? He said, well, we'll do the last two questions in the physics and maths papers, for example. Uh, we'll do the last two questions first, then we'll go back to the beginning. That means on most of the questions, we'll be about 10 minutes behind everyone else in Britain. So we'll get a boost by morphic resonance. <laughs> so um, I, uh, I said, well, some of you, I said, it's a really good idea. But I said, some of your friends must have been morphic resonance skeptics. He said, yes, they were. Uh, and I said, what did they say? And they said, what if morphic resonance doesn't really happen? And he said, we worked out if it doesn't happen, we wouldn't lose anything. But if it does, we'd gain extra points. They all got A stars. Uh, well, it's a small sample. Uh, it doesn't prove anything. Uh, but uh, I happen to know the head of the OCR examination board, the science exams, an old friend of mine from Cambridge. Um, I tried to persuade him to change the order of the questions in a random subsample uh, of, of the tests and turn the entire national examination system into a morphic resonance experiment. Um, but he was very excited for a couple of days and then he rang me up and said, look, he said, I'm hoping to retire on a full pension. Uh, and he said, I just don't think I can do this. Uh, it's a shame because it would have been a brilliant experiment. The principle whereby this works is called morphic resonance. Morphic resonance comes from the Greek word morphe, meaning form or shape, and resonance, uh, which you're familiar with from acoustic resonance and all sorts of other resonances. Uh, the idea is that similar patterns of activity resonate with other similar patterns across space and time. And that's the basis of this memory process. The similarity is what really uh, is important here. The more similar, the greater the resonance. If you're thinking about people, then obviously the most similar people are going to be identical twins. Um, so I would expect identical twins, even if they're separated soon after birth, to have an exceptionally strong resonance with each other, so that if one does something, the others are more likely to do it. Studies on identical twins separated soon after birth show there are extraordinary similarities in their lives. Um, and uh, this usually leads to the debate that everyone here is familiar with. Is it nature? Is it nurture? If they're so similar, even if they're separated soon after birth, it proves it's all in the genes. It's genetically programmed. The whole edifice of selfish gene theory, sociobiology and so on, ultimately rests on these twin studies. I don't think they prove anything of the kind. I think that they provide very good res uh, uh, evidence for morphic resonance uh, rather than genetic determinism. Now, similarity is the key, and if you ask yourself the question, who in the past was most similar to me, the answer is you yourself. We're all most similar to ourselves, uh, uh, more similar to ourselves in the past than to anyone else. I think that the resonance from our own past, self-resonance, is the basis of what keeps our form the same, even though the chemicals and the cells in our body are continually changing. I think it's also the basis of memory. I think self-resonance is why we resonate with ourselves. Uh, we resonate with lots of other people, and that's the basis of collective memory, which Jung called the collective unconscious. But we resonate most specifically with ourselves. That's how our memories work, I suggest. Attempts to find memories in brains have been going on for over 100 years. They've been extraordinarily unsuccessful. Um, it's continually elusive, and I think the reason memory is so elusive, long-term memory stores have not been found. Uh, uh, I think the reason they haven't been found is because they're not there. Uh, it's a very simple explanation for the experimental data. Of course, if you damage the brain, you can get loss of memory, uh, but that doesn't prove the memories are in the bit you damage. If I damage your TV set in the sound circuit, I could make it aphasic so that it doesn't produce any sounds, but that doesn't prove all those sounds originate inside that bit of the TV set. They're important for tuning into them. So I think we tune into our memories. I don't think they're all embedded uh, inside the brain. Now, this has a huge number of implications, as you can probably see. Um, and uh, this theory also has huge implications for social inheritance. 
and uh, for the nature of rituals, where people deliberately do things in a similar way as possible. I think setting up a morphic resonance with those who've done uh, the same ritual before. But I can't go into any more of these implications because the magic time is up, 15 minutes has passed, and I'll have to leave you with those thoughts.